Welcome again to Rangeland Principles at the University of Idaho. Today we're going to talk about rangeland plants. This is Karen Launchbaugh, professor at the U of I, but also to, um, happy to say that today Jake Price, one of our graduate students here, is going to tell us about range plants. Hey, so today we're talking about physiology and morphology of rangeland plants. There are four major growth forms that we divide rangeland plants into. And that's grasses, grass likes, forbs, and shrubs. Our grasses and our grass likes make up our monocots. Monocots tend to have a narrow leaf blade, a long and narrow leaf blade with parallel venation. So you can imagine like a grass leaf. Um, they're very long, not very wide. And if you look real closely, you can see that the veins are all parallel. They're all one next to the other in a very uniform fashion. The other group are dicots. Our shrubs and our forbs make up this group. The dicots tend to have a broader leaf um, with a netted veination. You can see here on this leaf, we have these primary veins. And then we have all of this webbing that goes in between these primary veins. So those are some simple characteristics that split up those two different groups. So what makes our grasses special? What differentiates them from our forbs and our shrubs? Well, grasses have no showy flowers. They can be small to large. And these are the points I would stress. They have jointed stems, so they have nodes and internodes. Their stems are also hollow. Their leaves have parallel veins and their root systems are fibrous. So what will help differentiate grasses from grass likes will be mainly the presence of a jointed stem with nodes and internodes and hollow stems. So our grass likes. These are our sedges and our rushes. Again, they have no showy flowers and they can be small to large. So what helps differentiate sedges and rushes from grasses would be that they have stems without joints. No nodes and no internodes. Their stems are also hot, solid. They are triangular or round. Sedges will have a triangular shaped stem and rushes will have a round stem. If you hold them in between your fingers and roll them, it'll help tell you the difference between a sedge and a rush. If you cut them open to see if they're hollow or solid, it will help to tell you whether they're grass or grass-like. Again, our grass-likes have parallel veins and fibrous root system like our grasses. Moving on to forbs, our forbs have showy flowers, solid stems, broad leaves, and taproot systems. A taproot system is where one large root grows deep into the ground and then secondary roots grow off of it. The broad leaves differentiate them from our grasses and our grass likes. We'll begin to see a lot of the netted veination in our forbs and our shrubs. And their stems are also solid. To differentiate a shrub from a forb, the main characteristic I would look for would be woodiness. If I'm looking at a shrub, if I'm looking at a plant and I'm noticing that it seems to be woody throughout, both near the base and up around the top where the new growth is, I would say it's a shrub. Some forbs can get rather large, just as some shrubs can be rather small. So the characteristic that we want to stress here is, is it woody in nature? Is it woody throughout? Other than being woody, we'll have several main stems broad leaves with taproot systems. So lifespan. 
Another way to divide up a lot of these plants, other than just grass, grass-like, forb, and shrub, is the length of time from the beginning of their development to the death of them, death of the plant. So our shortest lived plants will be our annuals, and they will live for one growing season. And within this growing season, they will germinate, grow, produce seed, and die. And within there we have winter annuals and summer annuals, which we'll go over in the next slides. Beyond annuals, we have biennials, which grow in their first year to produce a basal rosette over winter, and in the second year sprout, produce seed, and die. So our annuals live for only one year, whereas our biennials will live for two years, for at least two years. Our perennials are our longest live, longest lived plants. They will live from one year to the next, where they grow, build up, accumulate biomass essentially, and produce seed, and then over winter, and then the next year will grow, build up biomass, and produce seed, and over winter, and they will do this over and over and over again until they die. Within our annual group, we have winter annuals and summer annuals. Our winter annuals will sprout in the spring and produce seed and then die early on in the summer. And then that seed that was produced in the spring will germinate in the fall, accumulate biomass and go dormant over the winter and then in the spring re-sprout. Re-sprouting versus germinating takes less than half the time most often. This saves the plant time. Our summer annuals will germinate in the spring, grow throughout the summer, produce seed in the fall, and then die over winter. This is a pretty common um, life cycle for most of our plants that we'll see. Biennials will germinate in the spring of their first year, produce a rosette and develop roots over the summer and fall of their first year, build up underground biomass and go dormant over the winter. Then in the spring of their second year, they will sprout, produce a flowering stalk, and then over summer produce seed and into the fall and the winter they will die. So this is a two-year life cycle for biennials. Perennials will germinate, flower, produce seed, build up root reserves, and go dormant year after year after year. They will germinate, flower, produce seed, build up reserves, go dormant. Germinate, flower, produce seed, build up reserves, and go dormant. And they will do this year after year after year. A lot of our bunch grasses can live for up to 12 years. So they would be completing this cycle 12 times. Um, there are other species of plant that, that live for much longer. So, I mean, 20 to 30 years, 20 to 30 cycles completed. So now we're getting into the morphology of range plants. This is what you're picturing in your head when you imagine a plant, when you imagine a grass, or you imagine a forb, you're imagining a collection of leaves, stems, roots, and flowers. We'll begin with the leaves, which are the photosynthetic organs of the plant. There are many different types, arrangements, shapes, margins, and venations that help us to differentiate one plant from another. Leaf types, we have two. We have simple and compound. Simple leaves are undivided leaf blades, which are not separated into leaflets. Compound are leaves separated into two or more distinct leaflets. We have two different forms of compound leaves. One is compound palmate, and the other is compound pinnate. Compound palmate is pretty easy to remember if you imagine palmate as looking a lot like your palm. So the leaflets spread out kind of like a hand. Pinnate 
is where the leaflets are organized almost like a ladder. They step up one rung after another. So alternate leaf arrangement is where we have <clears throat> a single leaf born at each node. As we move up the main stem, we'll come to a node and then off to the right, there will be a single leaf and then we'll move up the stem farther to a second node and there will be a single leaf off to the left and it will continue in this fashion all the way to the end of the stem. Opposite leaf arrangement is where we have two leaves born from a single node, normally across from one another. And then world leaf arrangement is when we have three or more leaves born from a single node, typically revolving around the stalk. These are good examples of alternate opposite and world. We can see on alternate where we have a single leaf coming out of each node. So we come out of a node on the right and there's a leaflet and then we move up and there's a node on the left and a leaflet. And then we move up again and there's a node on the right and a leaflet. We move over to opposite. This may be kind of difficult to see, but essentially what is going on here is as we go up the stem, we find a node and out of that node comes one leaf to the right and one leaf to the left. We then move up the stem again and we come to a second node and again, there's two leaves. One leaf comes out to the right and the other comes out to the left. World, this is a pretty good picture. We come up to a single node and we have three or more leaves that come out of that node. So leaf shape. We have linear, linear elliptic, lanceolate, oblanceolate, ovate, obovate, and palmate. Linear resembles a line. It is narrow with more or less parallel sides. Linear will be much longer than it is wide. Elliptic is kind of the shape of an ellipse or a narrow oval. It will be broadest in the middle of the leaf and narrower at the two ends. We will also generally see elliptic leaves being much longer than wide. Lanceolate is lance shaped, so it will be much, much longer than wide, with the widest point being near the base. It's oblanceolate, so the prefix ob means opposite or upside down. Lanceolate, like before, is lance shaped. So whereas we had lanceolate before, which was lance-shaped, we have oblanceolate, which is upside-down lance-shaped. Where we have a shape that is much longer than wide, with the widest point being near the top. Ovate is egg-shaped in outline, attached at the broadest end. Ovate leaves will tend to be about as wide as they are long. Obovate, like oblanceolate, is ovate but upside down. So where we're seeing the widest point on an ovate leaf at the bottom near the base, on obovate we're seeing the widest point near the top. And then we have a palmate leaf shape where the leaves veins are all coming out of a single point near the base of the leaf and we're seeing this palm like fashion it looks like a hand leaf margins we have lobed pinnate lobed palmate entire serrate sinulate and involute so an entire leaf margin the leaf margin for starters is the very outer portion of the leaf. It is the most outside point. So on an entire leaf that outer edge will be smooth. It will be completely smooth. Whereas on a serrate leaf 
as we run our fingers along that outside edge, that margin, we will feel tiny little serrations. Sinulate, sinuate, like serrate, we will feel these little bumps and, and grooves as we run our finger along the margin. But unlike serrate, these will feel almost more rounded than sharp. We go up to lobed pinnate and lobed palmate. We have a smooth leaf margin, but we're getting these funny lobes, these funny little patterns with the outside of the leaf. Lobed pinnate, like a ladder, we're seeing it um, kind of one rung on top of another. Lobed palmate, like a hand again that opens up. Involute is a funny leaf margin. It's uh, you've typically seen in desert plants or plants that are concerned with conserving water. Um, it's where the leaf margin curls upwards and inwards. It's a function that the plants use to help conserve water. Leaf veinations. So like our grasses have parallel veination. We look at them real close and we can see these veins that are one right next to each other in a very orderly fashion. Move on to pinnate, kind of like we've said before, the veination almost looks like a ladder. It's one rung on top of another as you move up. Palmate, again, we have a singular point at the base of the leaf where all the veins originate and then they move out almost looking like a hand. Netted leaf venation is where we have a primary, we have our rachis that runs down the middle of the leaf, and then we have our primary veins that run off of our rachis, and then we have secondary veins that run off of those primary veins, and then we can even have other veins that run off of those secondary veins. So this inner space in between these secondary and these primary veins becomes kind of a jumble of veins. To notice venation, you're going to have to look at the leaf very closely. So pretty cut and dry definition of a stem, which is the portion of the plant axis bearing nodes, leaves, and buds that is usually found above ground. So pretty cut and dry definition of a stem, which is the portion of the plant axis bearing nodes, leaves, and buds that is usually found above ground. Some examples of reproductive stems would be rhizomes and stolons. Rhizomes are underground modified stems that give rise to new plants. So under the soil surface, the plant will send out a little tiller that will move along just below the surface and every so often it will pop up and a new plant will begin growing. These plants will all be genetically the same. Stolons are a modified above ground stem that will give rise to new plants. So when you think of a stolon, a common example of a stoloniferous plant would be like a strawberry plant. Strawberries will reproduce via stolons, so they will send out a little tiller or a little shoot. The shoot will run along the ground and then every so often it will send out a root. And a genetically similar plant will begin to grow. This doesn't mean that these plants don't still reproduce via seeds. It just means that they reproduce both asexually and through seeds. These are some examples of rhizomes and stolons. We see over here on this grandma grass, we have a, a fairly large rhizome. And over here on this curly mesquite, we can see this above ground stolen. Roots. Roots are the portion of the plant axis lacking nodes and leaves and usually found below ground. So our two groups are split up into fibrous roots and tap roots. So our grasses and our grass likes will have fibrous root systems, whereas our forbs and our shrubs will have tap root systems. Again, a taproot is where we have one primary large root 
that goes deep down into the ground and secondary roots come off of it. Whereas a fibrous root system, there is no primary root, it's just a large mat. So flowers are the reproductive portion of the plant consisting of stamens, pistils, and usually including a perianth of sepals or both sepals and petals. So that was a lot of confusing terminology, but we're going to go over it here in a second. There are many different types of flowers or inflorescence types. We have spikes, racemes, panicles, umbels, and heads. A spike is where the flower is attached directly to this main stem. Whereas with a raceme, we have our main stem and then we have a small secondary stem that comes off and then our flower hangs off of it. So a raceme is a single flower born on a secondary stem that shoots off of the main stem. A panicle is when we have our main stem and then secondary stems branch off of it and then multiple flowers branch off of that. So a panicle we have multiple flowers being born on a secondary stem which is attached to the main stem. An umbel is a flat topped or convex inflorescence with the pedicels arising. So we have our single stem that comes up to a point and then we have multiple stems bearing flowers that come out of it and then we get this flat top. A head inflorescence is when we come to the end of a stem and then we have multiple multiple flowers that are all kind of clumped together like this. An example of a head inflorescence would be a magnolia. A magnolia tree bears a head inflorescence. So some of the terminology that we went over earlier in that definition of a flower. We had mentioned stamens and stigmas. We had mentioned petals and sepals. So this is a pretty intense um, description of a flower that we don't necessarily need to memorize. As long as we look at it and we realize that a flower contains many different parts. We have both male and female parts. Our male parts made up of our stamen. Our stamen is made up of our anther and our filament. Our female parts are our carpal, which are made up of our stigma, style, and ovary. Our petals are the showy part that we tend to see a lot. Our sepals are kind of a lesser showy part that will bear itself below the petals. Sometimes these sepals can be colorful and sometimes they, they won't be colorful. So last but not least, composite flowers. Composite flowers are a collection of many flowers. Here on this middle diagram, we see where we have disc florets and ray florets. Both of them are an individual flower. So here on this middle diagram, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine or so disc florets and ray florets. Each one of these nine florets is an individual flower. So it contains all of the male and the female parts that we went over in the previous slide. The difference between a ray floret and a disc floret comes down to whether or not they're producing pollen or nectar primarily and the shape of the flower. So it gets a little complicated, but for now, if we just know that a composite flower is a composition of many individual flowers. So kind of like I said here on this middle diagram, we can see nine disc florets and ray florets and if we just imagine each one of those little florets being an individual flower, we'll begin to understand what a composite flower really is. It's just a composition of many, it's a collection of many little flowers.
And that is all for today.